So it's a couple of minutes past five, so we might as well get started. I know there's a few people on the call, um, but we look forward to more people joining as we progress this evening. So firstly, I'd like to introduce myself. My name's Joe Powell. I'm Viva Energy's Engagement Manager for the Energy Hub. And we're so pleased to be able to share with you tonight information about our vision for the site, which is the Energy Hub. But before I get going, I would firstly like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where we gather today. For most of us, we are located on the lands of the Wadarung people. I pay my respect to those traditional custodians, past, present and emerging. About two years ago, Viva Energy announced our idea of the Energy Hub. This is our vision for the Geelong site to manufacture and deliver traditional fuels as well as offering traditional and alternative energies. It's building on our strengths as a manufacturer and a provider of energy for Australia for over 100 years. We believe that we, Viva Energy, will play a very important role in energy security now and into the future. Earlier this month, we announced two important projects as part of the Energy Hub, that being our hydrogen service station and our solar farm. We are really pleased to be able to share with you tonight more information about these projects and show how our vision of the Energy Hub is coming to life. In addition, from talking to the community for the last 18 months, about the gas terminal, we know that many of you are interested and there is some concern about there, about the project. But now that the gas terminal environment effects statement is on public exhibition, we really hope to share with you more information about this important project and what we're doing to ensure that the project operates safely and sustainably. So this evening, to provide information on all these projects, I'd like to call upon my colleagues who have been working on these projects intensely to give you insight into how they're developing. So I'd like to introduce Lachlan Pfeiffer. Lachlan is our Chief Business Development and Sustainability Officer, and he will provide us with detail about Beaver's role in the energy security and the energy transition. We'll then hear from Sandra, who is our future, our future fuels manager. And she's really led the work with the hydrogen service station and will describe how an Australian first is happening right here in Geelong. We'll then hear from Mark Gahadi, the projects manager, who's been working on the solar farm and will show how we'll be using renewable energies to power our existing refinery. And finally, we'll hear from Rob Mackey, the gas terminal project manager, who can provide insight into the environment effects statement. So what we'll do, each presenter will provide a bit of information on their topic areas, and we'll also have Q and A's following each section. And we really encourage you to use the chat function below. So at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q and A tab. It's there where you'll be able to put in the questions and we will be able to answer those as we go through. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. We're really delighted to be able to show you the progress that we're making on the Geelong Energy Hub. So over to you, Lachlan. Thanks, Joe, um, And welcome everyone. Just wanted to also say thanks to everyone for taking some, some time out of their day to uh, to join us and to, and to hear the story. Um, and yes, as Joe said, encourage anyone to, to raise any questions that they might have so we can pick them up as we go along and, and make sure we get them into the, the Q&A. Um, absolutely keen to hear what questions people have and, um, and we can get you the answers for those as well. So we might just jump to the next slide um, uh, after this one. So Joe's introduced this, but this is um, just to give you a bit of an overview of our vision for the site, which we've been working on for you know, two or three years now, which is really about identifying um, the site of Geelong as being, uh, it's already a key part of national um, energy infrastructure. 
with the refining operations that we have there. We've been refining in Geelong since the, the 1950s, so we've been here a long time and um, we're a key part of the Geelong community and we, we really want to maintain that and the jobs we provide and the services we provide out of um, the site well into the future. But the recognition was that the site needs to evolve with the times and, and we're going to move into an energy transition over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 and, and longer years as we move the country to net zero. And facilities like Geelong and sites like Geelong need to, to play their part in it. Um, it is a, a transition, uh, not, a, not a direct switch, as we, we like to say, but um, we think that the um, site has some, some great advantages and we try and draw them out on this slide a little bit. Um, it's got great um, access to all forms of transport. So we have a working um, industrial pier at the site where we currently bring crude and some other products into, into Victoria. We're closely connected to the rail system and the road system and, and also to aviation um, through both Avalon and um, Melbourne Airport. And we're close to the, the, the Melbourne you know, um, centre of population as well. So um, it's, a, it's a great site and, and we think it's got a great future. And the vision for the Energy Hub is to start to bring in a diversified range of fuels over time and to continue to provide that um, cornerstone of sort of economic and fuel security support that we've been providing for a long time and not to just to provide that but to also expand that over the years. We'll just um, jump to the next slide and this slide really talks to how we see our role as um, uh, an energy supplier in the energy system um, in a transitioning world. So we're a major fuel supplier um, in the country. We supply um, about 25% of Australia's liquid fuels and lubricants and over 50% of Victoria's demand comes through the Geelong site. And so that refining capability at Geelong, of which there's only two refineries left in the country, is criti critical to the, the, the nation's fuel supply. And it's important we continue to do that well into the future. Um, the gas terminal project, which um, the context of what we're discussing is, is, is in which, um, is a key part of that energy security story as well. We in Victoria um, uh, use a lot of gas and that gas supply is beginning to fall off from the Bass Strait. And so this is, provides a flexible replacement gas source. But we'll talk to that a bit later and, and Rob's going to talk through that. And, I'm, and I know you're all aware of that project as well. So that's the energy security side of what we do. And um, the energy transition is very much looking to alternative and replacement fuels in the future and currently, um, as we seek to bring lower carbon options. Um, and we at Viva Energy think of that in three categories. Um, we think of it in a, a business that we already have up and running called our, our carbon solutions business. And that's about working with customers all over Australia with regard to their emissions profile and how we can help them reduce those emissions whether that's in more traditional fuels like um, uh, our biofuels that are used as alternatives to straight diesels and petrols, or whether it's offset fuels. Last year, we launched the country's first fully offset aviation jet fuel. And that's recognizing that there's some categories of fuels which are very hard um, to uh, replace with lower or zero emission fuels. And so, the transitional solution until we have those solutions is to, to provide offset certified carbon neutral fuels. And we'll expect that to expand a bit over the, the coming period. And to, as an organization, get involved in general in carbon credit generation and sourcing um, uh, to provide sort of financial support into, into that carbon market and that carbon world. Um, we also have a new energies team that looks to some of many of whom are on the call today who are looking to bring the new technologies to market um, and find the commercial pathways and find the introductory pathways to bring um, uh, replacement um, fuels to Australia. Um, and so as we've got listed here, that um, can look at a number of different types of fuels, but includes the ones you'd expect like um, electric vehicles and the provision of um, uh, EV charging infrastructure. Um, 
solar we're going to talk about today and hydrogen we'll, we'll talk about today as well. We also have some um, initial projects underway in the biogas sector to provide um, low carbon gas solutions to market. And then the third part of our energy transition is of course our own um, footprint. Um, we have set net zero commitments for the whole organization out to 2050. To break that down a bit more, um, uh, our organization, when we look at our scope one and two emissions is very he heavily weighed to the operations at Geelong. So we've set more ambition targets for the, the non-refining parts of our business to, to have them at net zero by 2030. And we've set emissions intensity targets for the Geelong refinery for 2030 um, to reduce those by 10%. And then overall a, a net zero goal for the, for the company as a whole by 2050 aligning um, with the Australian targets. Um, with regard to the gas terminal project itself, um, uh, we've committed to offset and have that net zero from day one. So that's through the construction phase and through all operations. And um, that's how we like to think of new projects and new infrastructure that we're they're bringing on, that we bring the sustainability lens to the planning part of the projects as we introduce them um, to the site and to the market. So that's the overall vision for how we think of, um, I guess, what is a dual role for Viva Energy. It's very important we supply and continue to keep the country running and the economy running with um, the energy security role we play. But we absolutely recognize the important role we've got to play in energy transition as well and bringing alternative and replacement fuels to market um, over the coming period. And with that, I'll, I'll conclude and I'll, I'll hand over to um, Sandra, who's going to talk about the hydrogen project, but I'll just do a process check with Joe as to whether there's any questions now you'd like us to address or whether we'll hold those to a bit later. There we go. I've been muted again in this meeting, um, but as of yet, there's no questions. So why don't we hand over to Sandra and we'll take any questions towards the end. Thanks, Drew. Um, can we switch slides, please? Excellent. Ah, perfect. There's a nice rendered image of what actually is Australia's most ambitious hydro and mobility project. And it's to refuel at least 15 heavy commercial back to base vehicles with green hydrogen that's generated on site. Hydrogen is part of a, a key part of our vision for the Geelong Energy Hub. And it will make Geelong actually the hydrogen mobility leader in Australia with the vision and ambition of the project that we have proposed and have received funding for. I thought I might take a step back as well, um, as I'm not familiar with the attendees and, and the knowledge about hydrogen. It gets talked about a lot um, recently in the last year or so. Um, and I'd like to note that it's used in a variety of applications within industry. It can be used to make fertilizer, it can be used to make ammonia, it can be used in uh, chemical processing, but I'd also like to note that it can be safely used in uh, transport applications. It has been in general transport since about 2014 when Toyota commercially launched their sedan fuel cell vehicle called the Mirai. Hydrogen is generally spoken about now when it comes to applications like transport in gaseous form, although you can get it liquefied if it's cold enough at negative 253 degrees. But in the discussions we, we are doing in the current state of the market, it's generally found as a gas and it's the lightest element on earth. When it comes to fuel cell electric vehicles, um, as the name implies, a hydrogen driven or powered vehicle is actually an electric vehicle. And in many ways, if you imagine a, a, a drivetrain and you've got an electric motor, the difference between a battery electric vehicle and a fuel cell electric vehicle is that the electric motor remains the same. In a battery vehicle, you have a battery that provides the power and with a fuel cell electric vehicle, you have a hydrogen tank that stores the compressed gas and then it feeds the, pre the gas into a fuel cell that can converts the gas into electricity, which then drives electric motor. This is how hydrogen can be a zero emission solution for heavy vehicle transport when the, when the hydrogen is generated from re renewable power sources like solar and wind. Uh, what we're doing in our project alongside the hydrogen is also offering EV charging which brings together a number of the zero emission technologies that we 
uh, that will support you know, Australia's net zero uh, ambitions. For those that aren't familiar with the industry, it's a pretty tough industry to crack because it's very much about this very much spoken about chicken and egg. You know, do you bring the vehicles first? There's nowhere to fill them. Or do you build lots of stations, but there's no vehicles to use them? So what we've done in this project is that we have brought together fleet operators, vehicle suppliers and government to address the sector of transport that can't easily be decarbonized with battery electric vehicles. And so therefore, as part of the project, road freight, the public transport buses that run around Geelong, as well as the uh, waste trucks that run around and collect rubbish will all be, or there will be uh, variations of them that will be running on hydrogen instead of diesel as part of this project. Um, it is the largest mobility project in Australia by far. Um, and you know it's received $22.8 million of funding from ARENA, which is an Australian renewable energy agency and is part of, and is um, uh, monitored or controlled by the federal government. But we've also been really lucky to receive state funding as well from the Victorian government. So we can see that there is a very uh, unison approach to the fact that we need to come together, collaborate and to build these projects to help our energy transition. Um, for, as an example, compared to other hydro mobility projects in Australia that have been um, built or are in progress of being built at the moment, it's probably about three to four times larger than those projects from a grant funding perspective. But from a vehicle deployment, a volume of hydrogen and ambition, um, I don't think there's much that's comparable out there, especially when it comes to um, working with partners to make it come alive. Uh, can we switch to the next slide, please? I think that's a good segue into this infographic, which really shows how all the partners play a really strong and key role um, in enabling the project and how they're all key, uh, have, they all have a key local footprint and local operations. Toll, which will be delivering fuel for Viva Energy, will be is is helping try and use vehicles that are fuel cells. Um, that is what is driving a demand and offtake from the station. That's also being supported by Cleanaway, who are going to be running these waste vehicles. Um, Balm and Water, who not only are running a vehicle, and this is a waste collection vehicle, uh, they're also supplying the recycled water to our electrolyzer to help us generate the hydrogen. And then we have CDC that will be putting two. Uh, fuel cell buses on the Geelong routes that you know you can take and, and catch your normal day-to-day -day, um, activities. Um, what makes this project so different from and actually unique among all the other Australian mobility projects to date is actually the fact that it's a non-captive project and when I say it's non-captive it's not Viva Energy building a station that only Viva Energy can access to run Viva Energy vehicles. It's a project that is open and actually fully public. So like any service station you see there now or that we have and, and everyone else has, anyone can go in. It's there to be just be um, eyeboard. To, you can touch the bowels or the, uh, the gas uh, nozzle. Um, you can see other people use it. Um, and this is what makes it different because we are making it, um, taking that next step along the way to making it from a, a, a pure small scale gen demonstration to like a next stage commercial venture. And this really is what make what will help make the technology become alive for the public. You can visit the station, you can touch it, you can see it, you can feel it. Um, and hopefully, you know, this means that the hydrogen industry, especially the mobility sector, gains great attraction to be a, um, a zero emission solutions that we need for those hard to transition sectors. Um, I think that's all I had to touch on from a overview perspective, I think. Um, Joe, did you want to run, check if there are any questions? I'd encourage anyone, if they do have questions th throughout the presentation, please just pop them in the Q&A box that is in the bottom banner of your screen. But at the moment, we don't have any questions. So thank you, Sandra. And we might hear from Mark about solar. Thank you, Joe. Um, can we flick over to the next slide, please?
Uh, thank you. Um, as Joe mentioned in her introduction, um, we're very excited to uh, also announce last week that uh, Viva Energy is intending to construct a solar farm at the northern end of the refinery site on some available land uh, at that end of the refinery. Uh, at, at present, we're talking about a solar farm that's nominally 15 or so megawatts, but we do have scope to uh, potentially make that a little bit bigger, just subject to uh, exact and uh, finalised site design. And that gives, uh, really adds a new dimension to the whole operation of the refinery site in that it uh, allows us to have a source of uh, green renewable energy, which uh, is, is behind the meter, much as your, the solar panels that some of you may already have on the roofs of your house, uh, to help uh, support or supply some of the refinery's power needs on site. And at peak, we expect that uh, uh, the solar farm across uh, the year would meet around about 10% of the refinery's electricity needs, whilst at the same time also reducing the uh, scope to emissions that uh, the refinery currently incurs by taking uh, electricity off of the grid. While the solar power generated by the site will primarily be servicing the refinery's power needs. Uh, it is possible that we can also export uh, electricity to the grid, which ultimately contributes to the overall decarbonisation of the Victorian uh, power network, uh, which is quite an exciting prospect for us as well. Um, the solar farm uh, as it's currently designed is intended to use latest technology uh, by facial solar panels. And we are intending to mount those on, on single axis trackers. And in simple terms, the single axis tracker uh, rotates during the course of the day to actually follow the um, path of the sun. So it is a little bit different to what you almost certainly have on the roof of your house at the moment, which is uh, a fixed panel. Uh, this one starts out primarily facing east in the morning, rotating through to face effectively um, straight up vertically during the middle of the day and then uh, progressively in the afternoon rotated towards um, uh, the west to maximise the solar farm efficiency and the generation of the, of the solar power. So it is, a, it is a, a more complex and more expensive construction than, uh, than fixed panels but it really helps us to maximise the efficiency of the farm and, uh, and get the most out of that. The uh, specific site for the solar farm has been uh, optimised to allow us to retain the vegetation buffers that are currently uh, in place on that site. So on the, the road and railway frontages, we will be ret retaining uh, vegetation buffers just to minimise the visual impact of the site. And there's also uh, will be treatment on the solar panels themselves to minimise the glare. But again, as you've probably noticed, even from uh, uh, solar panels that are being installed on houses, um, glare has generally ceased to be an issue on solar panels with the latest generation of, of panels. They generally have a non-reflective coating on them already, uh, which just minimises the impact on, on uh, neighbours. So as I said, this is quite an exciting development uh, from our perspective. Uh, it, it's very consistent with our vision for the uh, Geelong Energy Hub in enabling us to move towards lower carbon uh, energy sources in future, uh, whilst recognising that this is part of a transition and, uh, and uh, we will need electricity for the refining operations for a long time. This is a way of helping us minimise um, the scope to emissions. So I might uh, stop there and see whether there are any questions, Joe, or uh, alternatively, um, hand back to you. Thanks, Mark. We actually do have a question, but it's about hydrogen. So let's move on to Rob about the gas terminal and then we can take questions on all topics towards the end. So thanks, Mark. And over to you, Rob. Great, thank you, Joe, and, and thanks everyone for uh, for coming along tonight. Uh, there's a couple of exciting projects that we've just heard about, and and here's a third one that that's a little bit older 
news, I suppose, uh, than the hydrogen refueling or the <coughs> the solar one. Um, and it's the, the the LNG gas terminal. And there's lock touched upon earlier. Um, you know, we, we, we see a need for gas in Victoria for a long time, and and that's because Victoria uses a lot of gas, and there's, there's around about two million households and, and sixty five thousand businesses which rely upon it. And we've relied upon it for many years because we've had a, a gas supply coming out of Bass Strait. Um, it's been cheap and plentiful, and, and a lot of us have, have built our lives around it in, in some shape or form. And then with that supply dropping off, um, there, there is gonna be a gap and, and this project really aims to fill that gap. Um, and then Geelong really is an outstanding site for this type of a project. Uh, obviously, we're an industrial area. We've got, got the refinery that's been operational for 65 years. But it's so close to the population centres of Melbourne and Geelong. Um, and it's got great infrastructure around it as well in terms of the, the port facilities, but also high voltage electrical and gas network infrastructure as well. So the, the site is really well suited to this type of a project. And we've been working really hard over the last probably 16 to 18 months going undertaking environmental studies as well as the engineering design work that you need to to do with a project like this as we've undertaken the ees or the environmental effects statement uh, as required by the victorian government and we've undertaken a, around about 15 or 16 studies and what's that shown is that we can complete this project and construct it and operate it without impacting the environment and one of the key focus areas for us during the, the AES, uh, the studies was around marine ecology. And what we found was that the, the marine environment around the refinery really is thriving. And, and that that's a, gives us great confidence because we've been in operation for 65 years and we've seen the, the seagrass is, is plentiful. There, there's lots of marine life. There's a Ramsar wetland not too far away from us uh, and all in, in very, very good health. And, and the studies have shown that that won't change with this project. So that gives us great confidence that we can execute this project in, in an environmentally friendly manner. Um, and with, with that EES process, we've recently completed it and submitted that to the Victorian government. And it was put on public exhibition around about a week and a half ago. And it's on exhibition for six weeks. Um, so anybody can can go online, they, they can take a look at any of the work that was done, um, they can ask questions around it and we're certainly willing to, to answer any questions that, that people may have. Um, it, it's very detailed and, and you'll see that there's a, a heck of a lot of work done there. Uh, and we expect by the time we go through the whole EES process that we'll get a decision sometime at the back end of August probably from the, uh, from the planning minister. So that, that's where that's at. And I thought before I, I move on and, and talk about our timelines, if people have been following the progress of the project and the EES going on exhibition, there, there was a query raised last week about how we would captured and documented the, the greenhouse gas emissions um, and, and why our emissions were less than a similar project that AGL were we're proposing uh, last year. So I thought I'd close off on, on that one now in case there are people who do have questions about it. But essentially it comes down to the fact that this project is, it's similar in many ways to AGL, but it is quite different in how we're structuring it. And, and AGL were looking to, to build a terminal and then import the gas themselves and then sell to their customers. What we're looking to do is essentially provide the infrastructure for gas buyers and sellers then use our facility and it would be them that, that purchase the LNG and, and bring that to Geelong um, for regasification. And, and that, that's the, the major difference in the two projects. Um, but in, in, with a view to being transparent, what we did within the EES is we actually documented what those emissions would look like um, if, if we were to import the gas as well, just to provide that context. So I did want to just close off on, on that. And we spent some time last week addressing that also. Uh, so from a, a timing perspective, I mentioned that August, we should get a, a decision a decision from the Victorian government. 
and then we'll make a final investment decision along with after that decision and along with some other deliverables that we need to do to undertake this project. And we're looking to, under, to take that decision in September of this year, which would support a first gas as early as 2024. Um, maybe that would go to 2025, but we could certainly make 2024 on that time frame. So that's where our project is at. We're, we've got a, a team of people that are, have been busily working on it for the best part of two years. Um, engineers doing technical design and, and a number of environmental scientists um, looking at the EES and, and, and undertaking those studies for us. So Joe, perhaps I'll pause there. I'm happy to take Great. any any questions or do we want to go back to the, the hydrogen question for Sandra? Um, <laughs> well, thank you, Rob. We actually do have some questions about the gas terminal, but before we get into that question and then we'll go back to the hydrogen question and any other questions that people may have. Um, I just want to one thank all the speakers for giving a real overview about how the business is looking for the future and really focused on that sustainability yet also really ensuring that there's fuel security for Australia uh, and Victoria. So in terms of the questions, what we will do is there's the panellists who you have met, but also on the call, we do have another, a number of other project team members, including Laura Bishop, who's the regulatory lead, Jeff Smith, who's the project director, Andrew Mathers, who's the safety advisor, and Michael Kaye from the Geelong Refinery here on the call as well. So they can also chip in if we get um, some other questions where their area is really brought to light. So given that, that Rob, we've just heard about the gas terminal and that it has been the focus of many people's time and effort over the last 18 months, why don't we start with a question from there? The question that we've been asked is, will there be any impacts on the Ramsar site as a result of the gas terminal? And if people don't know the location of the refinery very well, we have this incredible wildlife um, location that is about 1.3 Ks from the refinery site. And we've been doing a lot of studies uh, around the impacts of the gas terminal. So Rob, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Joe, and uh, and thanks for the question. The, the short answer is that the studies have shown that no, we won't impact on on that Ramsar wetland, um, and we've done a lot of work around marine ecology um, for this project. It's a major focus of the EES, and we've looked at at tidal and and current patterns. Um, we understand the the migratory birds that that use and and visit the Ramsar wetland what their food sources are and, and, and what it's shown is that this, this project can be undertaken without impacting any of that. Um, so that, that's a real positive for us. Um, as I mentioned earlier, what, what the, the whole ES has shown is that we can undertake this project without an adverse impact to the environment, which gives us, you know, a, it, it makes us more confident or, or very confident that we can execute this project. We've got Jeff from ACOM. Um, I suppose I've given the high level detail. Jeff's been working on, on this and his team very, very closely over the last you know, six to 12 months. So Jeff, jump in if, if you want to add anything ar around the, the environmental impact to the Ramsar. Yeah, sure, Rob. I'll just make a couple of other quick points on that. And I think you've answered it very well. But um, I think it's important to note, firstly, that the project doesn't involve any physical infrastructure at all on the Ramsar side. It's at least a kilometre distant from the closest point. So there's no physical disturbance. What, what we looked at in detail through our marine studies was the things that could potentially impact on the Ramsar site. And that's obviously things like um, the, the temperature coming out of the, um, the plumes from the discharge from the refinery, the residual chlorine that, that's in those plumes and also potential impacts on the food chain that migratory waders and other water birds rely on and taking those each in turn. The, um, as Rob mentioned earlier, the refinery has been discharging a very small amount of residual chlorine and warm water discharge for over 60 years. So it gave us the ability to look really carefully at the marine environment. And what we found was that, for instance, um, 
we looked for residual chlorine in mussels and did sampling around Crow Bay and there is no impact. The seagrass beds are very healthy and very similar under the current refinery plume and outside of the refinery plume. The temperature uh, plumes up from the current refinery don't reach the Ramsar site, neither do the residual chlorine discharges are in those plumes. So we also looked at whether there was scope for some of the plankton and larvae that uh, a food chain source for the migratory waders and other birds as to what level of those might be in, drawn into the water intakes associated with the project and found that uh, they were almost a 0.0% of, of the food source. And again, very, very unlikely there would be any impact whatsoever on the food chain impacting the Ramsar. So we're very, very confident with that empirical evidence that we've got over 60 years and our studies that there will be no impact whatsoever on the Ramsar site. Thanks, Thanks Jeff. Jeff and Rolf. That's a great overview. Understandably with the ES on exhibition at the moment, we do have a lot of questions coming through on the gas terminal. So why don't we take one more uh, related to that uh, marine environment and then we'll go back to hydrogen and then come back to the gas terminal. So Rob, linked to the question that we've just um, heard around Ramsar, what will the impacts on the marine environment be if the refinery closes? And I think that question also has a lot to do with one of the benefits of the project, which is the recycling of seawater. So perhaps you could explain a little bit about that as well. Yeah, I will, Joe. I might get the slide taken back and shown that I spoke to. If we can do that, that, that might help because one of the key advantages that we do have with this project is the reuse of, of chilled water. So if you, if you can imagine you've got LNG sitting in a ship at minus 160 degrees to turn that into a gas, you need to warm it up. The way that you warm it up is you use the, the seawater in Corio Bay through a heat exchanger. And what that does is it chills the, the Corio Bay water down. But rather than discharging that directly into the ocean or back into the bay, um, we can run that through our refinery uh, and our refinery uses around about the same amount of seawater as what the gas terminal will use. And it will heat it back up and then it will discharge it back into the, into the bay at a temperature closer to ambient. It'll be a, a little bit warmer than, than ambient because at the moment we discharge water about eight degrees warmer than, than the, the bay temperature back in. And we've been doing that for 65,000, 65 years, not 65,000 years. Um, so, so that, that works really well. And then the, the question about if the refinery was to shut down, what will we do? Yep, there it is. So it's that yellow dotted line where we're going to pipe the, the chilled water discharge. So the, the cooled water back into the refinery. And what we've done is we've designed a diffuser along the new jetty, which is a, a series of small nozzles, which will disperse the water the, the cooler water back into Corio Bay at, in such a way that it'll be warmed up and, and it won't impact the environment in a negative way. So we've not only undertaken the studies for when the, the chilled water is going back into the refinery as planned, but we've also undertaken that when the refinery isn't there. And it's shown that there won't be any negative impact on the environment either. So, so that gives us confidence and, and if the refinery wasn't to be in operation and, and that may be in a permanent manner down the track or, or if there's a, a shutdown of the refinery for maintenance, that we can continue to operate this facility without impacting the environment. Great, thanks Rob. And just one more question before we go back to hydrogen because it is sort of linked into that regasification pro process. There's a good question to to ask why is a FSR used um, opposed to an onshore plant for that regasification process? And would there be any regasification plants uh, planned for the future? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And that was a question that the, the project team came across a, and, and spent some time working through probably around about two years ago, or if not further, about what 
is the, the ideal and the best facility for this type of project. And we've gone with the FSRU model for a number of reasons. One is that when the, the project isn't required anymore, and that might be 20 years from now, um, then the ship can then, then sail away and, uh, and, and be repurposed as an LNG carrier, or it can be a, 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 a gas, a floating gas plant somewhere else um, around the world. Um, so so you, you don't have that you know, stranded asset. The other thing is that an onshore facility would take quite a lot of land and space um, and, and it would cost a, a lot of money to, to invest um, that. And you can see from, the, from what Mark and Sandra have talked about how we're gonna use the land around the refinery for alternative projects as well. So um, that, that were the two reasons why we've gone with, with this solution. Um, you know, it, it certainly reduces the, the amount of stranded asset that you might have at the end of the, the project life. Thanks, Rob. It's really great to be able to share the research and the studies and all the work that has been underway on the gas terminal for the last 15 to 18 months. But given we heard from hydrogen right at the beginning and we know with the announcement that there's a lot of interest, we might go to Sandra now to pick up a couple of the hydrogen questions. So the first question that we actually received around hydrogen is, is the volume of hydrogen produced only available for vehicles? Thanks, Drew. Um, great question. And um, probably like to flag that it isn't only very available for vehicles. So we'll have facilities as part of the design to fill tube trailers, which is currently how the gaseous hydrogen is moved around on transport. Um, so we can both uh, bring hydrogen in actually if there are issues for any reason. And we can also uh, fill other people's uh, tube trailers for them to take away and use in other applications. So pretty exciting, I think, that there's that uh, flexibility on the site as well. Great. And then in terms of when will we see it? When will the hydrogen station be built and ready to use? Oh, Joe, <laughs> put the pressure on. So yes, it is. Uh, we're aiming for late 2023 to complete construction and commissioning of the station. Um, you know, obviously in the current environment, there are a number of supply chain challenges for parts and equipments uh, that we're currently working through, but that's our target and, and hopefully we'll be hitting around that mark. Great, thanks, Sandra. And we might go back to the gas terminal because there's obviously interest in it at the moment. And um, so in terms of uh, the gas terminal, what is the, the life of the gas plant and considering that gas is imported as LNG. Um, sorry, let me start that again. Um, what, is the, what is the gas plant life cycle um, for the terminal and the FSIU? Yeah, that, that's a good question. We, we see this as a, a medium to long-term project. So we're, we're thinking it's at least 15 years. Or it might be as long as 20 years. Could be a little bit longer. Um, I think what, what we do know is that there's going to be a need for gas in Victoria for a lot of years to come. We, we use a lot of gas today and, and it's forecast that we'll continue to use gas. Um, so that, that's our view on it. It's, it's not a short term fill a gap in five years and, and then it's, it's project done. Um, it, it is hard to, to put an exact number on it. Like, like a lot of projects of this magnitude, um, sort of plan for for 20 years, 15 to 20 years, and, and it may extend it at the other end as well. Great, thanks Rob. And we've got two more questions at the moment around the gas terminal. Uh, so I think it's really important. We know that this is a topic that is of interest to the local community, and it has been an absolute priority for us in pulling together the AES and it will continue to be the focus of the gas terminal. But what are the safety risks associated with LNG carriers coming in and out of Corio Bay and how will that be managed? That's a good question and, and it is topical, that, that, that's for sure. And we're, we're really confident that we can one, construct and then operate this facility safely. And there's a number of reasons for that. And, and I might step through them 
essentially through the the delivery of, of LNG. So so LNG shipping um, has been around for 50 or 60 years as an industry, and, and there's a number of ship movements. There's thousands of ship movements each year around the globe. So there, there's a vast history um, there and knowledge about how to ship safely. And the industry is is really safe. Um, there hasn't been any instances of major losses of containment. Um, and that comes down to a few reasons. These LNG carriers uh, today, they're, they're modern vessels. They have modern uh, safety systems on them, um, lots of instrumentation so you understand uh, whether you do have a leak and then you, you can manage it. Then also the design of the ship, uh, they're, they're a double-hulled vessel. So I like to think of it as you, you've got a, a tank inside a tank and and both of those are a really thick steel and then there's insulation in between them as well um so it's uh they're, they're well designed they're, they're well instrumented and, and, and well controlled so so that that's the ship when they come into victorian waters like, like all ships they're, they're overseen by ports vic um and, and that's around pilots being on board, there, there we tug escorts, there we speed restrictions and, and traffic management through the channel, um, whether that's at the heads in the Port Phillip Bay or, or then into Carayo Bay. And, and obviously, Viva and before Viva Shell has been bringing in crude oil in, in ships, uh, you know, hydrocarbon, and then also we've had product going going back out as well. So so we've got a lot of experience in in shipping of of dangerous goods and, and hydrocarbons. And then you, you overlay that with us and our um, management uh, and operation of a major hazard facility at the refinery, um, which we've been doing well and, and successfully for, for 60 odd years now, where we understand the, the risks associated with these types of activities. Um, and then you, you overlay the the regulatory environment that we have here in Victoria with, with WorkSafe, this will be a major hazard facility. So it needs to be licensed. So we need to be able to convince WorkSafe that, that it is safe um, to get a license so we can operate. And then also with the, the ports Vic around that shipping and, and ensuring the, the safety um, during that phase of it as well. So there's a heck of a lot of layers here that are in place to ensure that, that it, this this project overall is safe, let alone the the shipping, as the the question was. Great, thank you, Rob. I know it's been a real focus of the team, so it's good to be able to share that with everyone. We'll go back to Marine in terms of the gas terminal, Rob, and obviously Marine is one of the primary focuses that the minister has asked us to look at in terms of the AES. So, Rob, could you provide a bit of information, and maybe we can ask. Jeff for his insights too about how does chlorine affect the marine environment and what impact will chlorine have from the gas terminal into the bay? This might be one for Jeff. I, I can probably give a, a higher level answer and response in, in terms of the, this project won't see uh, uh, any real change in chlorine um, discharge back into the environment. Um, we, we, we already do through the, the, the use of, of seawater in the refinery. So there's residual chlorine um, that goes into the environment. We understand how that's impacted the, the marine ecology in the, around the refinery and that the, we've got healthy seagrass and the marine life's really healthy. So, so it, it's, it's not gonna impact, have a negative impact on the environment. In terms of what chlorine would do if there was a lot of residual there I'm not sure but uh Jeff I'm pretty sure would be able to to help us out with that yeah sure Rob and, and look I think we've got to be mindful here that the chlorine we're talking about is what we would call residual levels of, of chlorine that um, are coming out as you said uh, out of the refinery now and have done for 60 years and you can actually see a couple of photographs on the slides there and um you know, clearly it has no impact on marine uh, biota such as seagrass, which is thriving in the current refinery discharges. But interestingly, um, in laboratory testing, sea urchins are considered to be the most sensitive marine species to 
chlorine when it's dosed at, at you know very toxic levels and we found significant numbers of sea urchins directly under the current refinery plume and which has been going for 60 plus years and um, clearly the residual chlorine is not having any impact on what is considered to be a sensitive um, marine species to high levels of chlorine but we are talking about very very minor levels and the other point about chlorine is that it dissipates in the marine environment um, very very uh, very very quickly and becomes chlorides and other things that aren't detectable and the project is going to be discharging residual chlorine at around um, uh, a level of about four micrograms per litre and the limit for seawater in Victoria is considerably higher than that. So there is a high level of compliance with both the current refinery uh, discharge and the FSIU discharge going into the future. Thanks, great. Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. That gave a great overview. Um, we do have sort of six minutes to go. So I will ask anyone to put any last questions in, um, but we do have one remaining question. And Sandra, this is one relating to hydrogen. The question is, is hydrogen planned for export as liquid hydrogen or ammonia? You able oh, thanks, to provide Jane. a bit of insight into that? Sure. I think um, we just need to be a bit careful on terminology. I think in the hydrogen industry, when we talk about export, it's pretty much uh, you know exporting or selling to another country, so sending it overseas. Um, and our intent for the station in Geelong is not to do that, uh, because we are focused on growing the uh, domestic application and use of hydrogen and uh, particularly in transport applications. So that would then make the uh, probably question about liquid hydrogen or ammonia form to transport in a little bit redundant because we aren't intending to do that at this stage. Um, the capacity of the electrolyzer as well as two megawatts would be you know, really, in all honesty, too small to make any substantial uh, cargoes uh, for overseas markets. So it's just reinforcing that when we are uh, selling hydrogen out of the station in tube trailers would be for domestic use. Right, thanks Sandra. So we are coming to an end and I would really like to thank all the panellists but also all the community members who have taken time out of their day that it's always a busy period sort of after work five o'clock so really appreciate you coming in and asking the questions um, as you can see there is a lot going on at Beaver, uh, particularly the energy hub and we're really excited about how energy is evolving and to be part of that future um, so we hope this is the beginning of our conversations we have this year because there's so much going on at the refinery we have now established quarterly community meetings and the next meeting will be on the 26th of May. At this stage it is in person, it will be at the Norlane Community Centre just near the refinery um, but obviously we do need to manage COVID and see what the restrictions are at that stage but hopefully that will be in person. Um, in addition we do have a lot of ways to engage with the project teams in the next couple of weeks particularly while we have the environment effects statement on public exhibition so we have a shop a community information hub that is located at the Carayo village just near the Woolworths as you come in um, it will be manned from 12 to 2 every Thursday uh, but we are looking at having that open throughout the period as well. Um, we have a live chat which is accessible through the gas terminal website and I think the address is on the screen now. Um, that is available all the time for people to leave messages but we are available in person um, on the 15th, 21st, 28th of March and 4th of April. That's generally one to three on a Monday, but not next Monday because it's a public holiday and therefore that's on the Tuesday. We're also available by email, phone, and we're happy to take any more questions from you on any of these exciting projects. Um, so thank you once again for joining us this evening. It was really great to provide you with a little bit more uh, 
detail around these exciting energy hub projects and we can look forward to continuing to update you as the projects progress but have a wonderful evening and thank you very much